Let's give the choir a hand this morning. Very briefly this morning, we want to say we are thankful for all of you who came out during this week as we uh, had, I think, an extraordinary two days. Is there anybody here who was blessed by coming this week? And today will be no exception to that at all. As a matter of fact, uh, our men are very thankful for this, that we want to take the initiative to save all our men. Two things I want to say, and then I'm going to ask that uh, we have some announcements at the very end during our time of prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Atkins if he would. He may even make those later. But I want you to introduce our speaker today, for we really have someone who will speak to us. Right. There are times that I think, uh, I want to say the two announcements are these, and I will say, uh, th the first announcement uh, is that um, uh, in the programs or somewhere around is a flyer that I think all parents, all grandparents uh, need to look at. It's called The Core and Our Children, that as we are seeing across the nation what is happening with public education, the debate around charter and private that I have found a book that you are responsible for if you are interested in finding out what's going on in education, you've got to find and take the initiative to inform yourself. You cannot make the assumption that the school that is closest to your house is well educating your children. And so uh, I am giving a tool to individuals, parents, grandparents, community leaders, to be able to engage what's going on with public education and how ought I to handle private, public, charter, uh, and to understand that really what is at stake is not teachers or unions. What really is at stake is the future of our children. and do not read it any other kind of way. The next thing then is, uh, now I need to say as we have the baccalaureate, and I thank you all for your generosity and allowing the young people to come, but I must say as your pastor that I want to see our children applying to better schools. All schools are not equal. DeVry, Strayer College is not Penn. Help me, somebody. And so the list that I have. Of course, uh, we want all, ch no child, we want children have to find the school where they best can perform. Let me say that. But now, there's a list, and on that list, it says U.S. News World Report. Now, let me just simply say this, and then we'll be preparing to give. Is that we have to see, one, where our children will fit. Two, what our children want to, to do with their lives. And then we cannot just say these are the schools that will let them in. I'm not preaching, so don't give me all your amens, but at least give me one. More importantly, this is where my child can thrive. And so on that list... Many of these schools are giving full scholarships, but they are rewarding academic excellence. They are not giving full scholarships to 2.7. They're not giving full scholarships even to 3.0s. There's no reason if we don't have the money, there's no reason.
reason that our children should not be at least having 3.5s, at least 1500s on the SAT. And if these schools are willing to invest in our children, we ought to be willing to invest in them. Can I get an amen? And so as you look at that list, as our scholarship committee is starting to get started, our children will do what we invest in them to do. And if we do not invest in them, then we cannot be angry that in the harvest of their life they have nothing. And so saying that, we love you, God bless you, our leadership will come. Good morning, everybody. I don't think anybody uh, will doubt that the community we live in is in distress. That's no argument. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Now, some people look at it and say, forget about it. Some people look at it and say, I'm going to do something about it, and roll up their sleeves and they do something. The man he went yesterday, 20 years of a policeman in Newark, New Jersey. That enough will make you sit on the sidelines and say, enough is enough. But he took up on himself to go out and change what he could change. And that's a change agent. Mm. And change agents are like Christ. Mm. Because Christ was a change agent. Mm. And so Delancey Davis is not only bald like me, <laughs> but he's also a child of God like me. Yeah, right. So we want to introduce him and let him go at his thing. Thank you. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. In honor of the creator who creates all things great and small. In honor of my ancestors for not for some of their struggles of 1492, 1493, 15, 16, 17, 18, 1993. I could not stand before you free of mind, body, and soul in these millennium years, 21-3. In honor of Madonna Nera, the beautiful black Virgin Mary, the beautiful black baby Jesus. In honor of my mother's mother's mother, my mother, my grandmother. In honor of my past master teachers and mentors, Howard Sealy, Chief Willie Smoot, Sister Roxanne Gregory. In honor of you, brothers and sisters, friends and family, and some of the strongest black and Latina men and women I've ever known. I greet you in peace in the many tongues of our people. Peace, Hotep, Alafia, Hetepu, and as my young people say, what's up? Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> to my brother, friend, the Reverend Dr. Brett Stargell, a brother whom I met in Newark, New Jersey, doing work recently. I love this brother. We talk weekly and just talk. We just talk like brothers and men should talk. I thank you for the honor of being here yesterday and again today. I salute you, brother, and thank you. <laughs> to the Reverend clergy, the deacons, deaconess, who have been warm in your welcome of me here in this family. It felt like home, so much so that I drove back last night and drove back again this morning to Newark, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> that's right. It was a warm welcome, and there were so many good things that happened yesterday, and we're going to talk about some of that. And to the Canes Avenue Baptist Church that welcomed me here, thank you for the opportunity that you think it not robbery for a young ghetto child from Newark, New Jersey, to be able to get up, drive down the highway, and feel just as at home down north as I feel up north. I want to thank certainly my staff that made it possible to get me here this morning, my security teams, both the sisters and the brothers. But I want to just single out the young people that I was able to pick up. I called one at one in the morning. Her mother got out the bed and said, your godfather, your uncle from the community is going to church down in South Jersey. Do you want to go? And I said, you're not supposed to ask her, do you want to go? You're supposed to tell her she has to go. Because I was a little nervous as to what she might say at one in the morning. And she said, sure, I want to go. And she's here, Sahara. Stand up, sister, so we can celebrate you. Stand up so they can see you, girl. Thank you. And, a young, and she's from Elizabeth, New Jersey, and a young man that I've been mentoring since he was about five years old. And he's now he looks kind of tall. He's not a high school student. He's actually in the eighth grade, but he's a tall young brother. And I want to just acknowledge him from Wayne, New Jersey, Kendall Butler. Please give him a round of applause. And I'm only going to be here for a minute. Is that okay? Now, the elders told me yesterday, the brothers, the elders, and the young people, said, you got to bring that same kind of message that you gave us yesterday. Am I right, chat? Check. 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 Now, simply, those that weren't here yesterday and the brothers that missed it, we weren't going to tell you what check meant, but we don't want you to feel left out because as the pastor told me, I should be bringing a message as though we're dealing with Father's Day. It's a message to the men in the congregation, and sisters, you will appreciate it. Before I even get started, I want to be very clear. Because I'm talking to the men does not mean that I'm ignoring you. Because anything that's been accomplished in this country by black men has always been on the shoulders of black women. So I salute you first. The strongest black man I've ever known was my grandmother. Grandma was 81 years old when God sent her home. She was born 1901, died 1982, the youngest of 10 children. All her aunts and uncles were slaves. And Grandma raised me, so I'm Grandma's boy. I know I look a little young, but I'm Grandma's boy. And so I'm going to talk about Grandma throughout this message. But Grandma was clear that she was the strongest and she had the iron fist. Before my grandma transitioned, she had rheumatoid arthritis and her fingers had gotten cramped and things were starting to get a little bad in Newark. 
And we'd say, Grandma, don't go walk around the corner. They're robbing people. They're, they're sticking people up. We just don't want you to get hurt because Grandma was used to just doing her thing. And as you get up in age, you don't want to be locked behind the door, behind the gate, behind the walls in your home. Sound like Camden, right? So Grandma still wanted to get out. And so she, Grandma said, let me tell you something, boy. You know, they use boy not as a pejorative, but as a loving term. Let me tell you something, boy. If the mugger runs up on me to get my pocketbook, I'm going to take this hand right here, and I'm going to stick it back there, and I'm going to grab that, you know, and wiggle it off. Now, I didn't understand any of that. But Grandma had faith. And she had courage. Check. I want to just read just a piece of a scripture. Just a piece. We got all excited up here with Deacons and got nervous that I lost my place. I'm just going to paraphrase it. It's in Exodus 11 chapter. I think we're at 4, 5, and 6. But essentially what it said is that the firstborn are going to be killed including Pharaoh's firstborn, because everything that he wanted to do to Moses and Moses' people, am I right, Pastor? That's right, that's right. Was going to be done to him. And I start there because the message that we want to bring very quickly is one that says love, forgiveness, and reconciliation from boys to men serving God in ungodly times with some ungodly people. Let me say that again. Love, forgiveness, and reconciliation from boys to men serving God in ungodly times with some ungodly people. You see, four points I want to make. I want to talk to the men in the congregation and young men about manhood, having a purpose-driven life, our over-religiosity. Mm. Let me say that again. Now, as I said yesterday, I don't mean to step on any toes. Go ahead. In fact, I don't mean to offend anyone. But if I step on your toes, at least say ouch if you can't say amen. <laughs> Our over-religiosity. Because the last time I checked, the God that I serve wants spiritual fruit and not religious nuts. Let me say that again. Just touch him and say, say that again, Mr. David. See, some of us are so caught up in our religiosity that our children reject God, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Yoruba, or heathen. They don't embrace God. And so coming to you as a police officer with 20 years' experience in the street and having raised four children from the streets that I simply took in. One I adopted, the other three the parents just gave them to me. Three girls, one boy, between the ages of 12 and 16. They're now the youngest is 24, the oldest is 30. Everybody finished high school and did at least a year of college. Mm. But they had a common theme coming to me. They didn't believe in God. Mm. In fact, my son, who I call him my son, would say, you thinking about some pie in the sky God, Dad? I don't believe in him. And I would simply say, as the old people taught me, boy, you better find God before God finds you. And that's all I would tell them. But I also had to be a living example. And my fourth point is the disappearing black male. The disappearing black male. See, when I talk to the brothers here, we know, and the brothers talked about it yesterday, they are brothers that are saying they want to get involved. They're saying they want to do the right thing. And when we call them on the carpet, they disappear. And I'll say what I said yesterday. Everybody, all the women in the congregation can't possibly be with other women. <laughs> I'm not here to pass judgment on what you like and what your preference is. Yeah. But what I am saying, if you're going home when you get out of here and you're snuggling up to something that looks like a man, smell like a man, or smells like a man, 
you ought to at least have the temerity and the fortitude to make him act like a man. How do we come and serve God on Sunday and he's still in the bed? How do we get up and leave the baby boy in the bed? And then when he gets out to the streets and that crazy and come here begging and crying, talking about, I don't know what's wrong with him. Heck, I know what's wrong with him. While we can't make him serve God, as my mom used to tell me and grandma used to say, I'll make not serving God so difficult, you'll beg me to help you get to God. <laughs> it is the example that we're expected to set. I should see the God light on each of us. And none of us is perfect. Absolutely not. For only God is perfect, but we can strive to be Christ-like. That should be the goal each day. I said to the brothers yesterday, when I came in early, I was greeted with so much love, I didn't want to do anything. Brother was like, do you, do you need... The, and these were men giving this kind of love. Our children don't see this amongst men. They don't see us touching and hugging and loving and praying and holding each other up. See, the other people know the power of your sons. And so they sent a decree down that we're going to kill the firstborn. Because if you want to measure the success of a people, simply look at the condition of its women and its children. I know we're not going to, too many people are going to clap on that because some people already know how to step on toes because they left somebody in the bed. I'd have lost half the congregation already. How dare you come up in here and offend me because I left Fuquan in the bed sleeping. He don't work in a pie shop tasting pies, but he want to sleep late on Sunday. Well, you get check. You get up and go to work Monday through Friday, and he playing video games and come bring you lunch in your car at 12 noon. Touch somebody and say, Fuquan don't live with me. <laughs> but he's driving your car. And so I say this to the brothers, not knowing that the sisters are in the room, that brothers, the sisters are raising these boys by themselves. And how does a boy child get the manhood with no men in the house? How does a boy child get the manhood with no exposure to a man? And how do you know a man anyway? What does a man look like? What does a man smell like? And how do you know you are a man? I asked 25 men yesterday, what was a man? And we got 24 different definitions. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, if there's 24 different definitions amongst men, what do you think has happened amongst 100 women? You might as well give that an, exponen an exponential number because they got 2,000 different definitions. Well, you know, he, he made me feel good at night. You know, little girls, I'm, I love him, so I didn't date. I just love, he made my heart do this. Well, I got his seed, I got his little shorty. Where they do that at? Nobody's got time for that, but it's our fault. So let me start here to the young people here. I apologize to those of you who are 20 and younger for the failure of my generation and the one in front of me. I apologize to you for our failure to do right by you. I apologize because we left you nothing. I apologize because we poorly educated you. I apologize because the state has taken over this community. I apologize. It is our fault. And so the reason they wanted to kill the firstborn because they didn't want the truth to be told. And so it becomes our responsibility to tell the truth. The truth teller must exist, pastor. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. And people don't like the truth teller. Because grandma said, tell the truth and shame the devil. The scripture said, the truth shall... Tell somebody the truth shall set you free. So when you get home today, tell Fuquan to get up. That's the truth. <laughs> I know I'm in trouble now. See, when I leave here, I don't want you to remember 
that I participated in helping 12-year-old Lionel Tate, who was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, that I helped him get out three years later. I don't want that to be the message. I don't want it to be the message that we were able to get Grant Long, a basketball player, on the end of his career playing with the Grizzlies, who saw me on TV in Miami, invited me to his game, me and Lionel's mother, Kathleen Grosset Tate, at the end of the evening, he gave us a check for $50,000, which is how we were able to pay for the lawyers to get him out on appeal. I don't want you to remember that after they shot the brothers in the van on the New Jersey Turnpike, that the Lacey Davis and Sergeant Carol Russell, wherever she is in the back, we put 158 cars on the turnpike at 7A and shut it down. We said great adventure will be a great adventure if you think you can shoot our children and we're not going to have any response to it. We shut them down. 65,000 cars tied up on the turnpike. And when I went to meet with the executive director, Mr. Grossman, as a police officer, they're videotaping me and threatening me subtly. Got a Negro state trooper there looking at me cockeyed. If you block the highway, we'll lock you up. I said, well, I'm not going to break the law, and we are going to block the highway. <laughs> Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? I said, now, I'm not going to block the highway because I'm still a police officer and I need my money. I need my pension. I got children in college. But I'm going to go back to the hood, and I'm going to get Fuquan and Pookie and Peaches in them. We're going to go to the corner rent a wreck, rental car place. We're going to rent 20 wrecks for $12, park them across the turnpike, throw the key away, and walk away. When you lock them up, we're going to bail them out, and they will be heroes in the hood. I'm not lying. The sister will tell you. She sat in the meeting because men have to make hard choices. And you know yourself to be a man when those of us who are proven that we are men validate your manhood. You're not a man because you got five children with six women. And you obviously can't count because six women can't give you five kids, but that's another conversation. You're not a man because you beat your girl up. You're not a man because she cute and you think nobody want her but you because you got her terrified to walk away. You're not a man because you slinging drugs on the corner driving a nice whip as they call it a ride. That doesn't make you a man. You're not even a man because you look good. In fact, you're a mouse and your girl need a mouse trap and some cheese to get you out of the game. I love the brother, Pastor, because he's doing the work. I met him on the battlefield doing the work. You got to take the church to the people. You're okay, you're here. It's the folks that never come that need your message. And so you got to be the example of the congregation when you walk out. I'm not talking about Friday and Saturday either. Let me say that. I don't know who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you. The brothers already know this. How many of us, by a show of hands, got a cousin or two or aunt or uncle that you don't want to come to the family reunion because they're going to drink too much, eat too much, tell too much, and mess up too much, Shay? <laughs> so when I say something that sounds like I'm talking about you, I'm talking about your cousin that you don't want to come to the family reunion. The question is that how do we reach our men? By telling the truth. See, we have a hard time with the truth. We don't want to hear the truth, which causes us not to have a purpose-driven life. I'm a young man standing before you that struggled emotionally. As soon as I could have a guidance counselor, social worker, I got one. I cried often. I was talking to the deaconess, and I, we talked about my dad, and she just triggered it for me. She said, was your father in the house? I said, not my birth father, but my stepfather was dead of dad going good job. He's 80 years old now and still working, doing hair, been doing hair since he was 23 years old. So all I have is a good work ethic. Mm. My father would work 18 hour days. This is my, my stepdad I'm talking about, my brother's dad. He'd work 18 hour days and tell me on a Saturday, I'm tired and exhausted. He said, you don't sit down until I sit down. You don't do number one till I do number one. 
And if you go to do number two, cut it short, because we got customers coming in. <laughs> My birth father rejected me. My mother wouldn't tell the story. May God be pleased with her. She transitioned last year, and that was my rock. My birth father slapped her in her mouth at 19, and he was 33. She said she told him when she met him, my mother was a gorgeous model. Met him in Harlem, where she was living. And when he slapped her to the ground, she said she knew when she got herself up, as she apologized to him for offending him, that he'd never see her or me again. And she broke camp and never told me the story. So I'm saying to the brothers, first of all, if you put your hand on our sisters, you're not a man. You're a mouse. And I think they told me a few sisters have slipped into the audience in this forum. So let me just say to the few of you that slipped in, if you're going to raise this young male child in the hopes of getting him to manhood, then you need to know how to distinguish between a male, a mannequin, a misfit, and a man. A male makes a baby. A mannequin looks like a baby, a misfit acts like a baby, but men take care of babies. Yeah. Yeah. See, men know that they have to make sacrifices. My son that I talked about, who is now 30 with two children in Texas, he called me up and said, Dad, he called me Pop. He said, Pop, I want to apologize for all the times that I got angry with you. I want to apologize for not talking to you these last three years, Pop. I want to apologize for being angry that you were angry that I didn't do what you asked and you simply stopped talking to me. He said, because I'm now working like crazy and I hate the woman that I'm with with these babies. But all I ever saw you do from the time I was 12 years old was work and sacrifice for us. And we weren't even your children. We weren't even living with you. And you took care of us. So you have shown me what a man is. If there's a brother in this room that's not mentoring a young man, you're not quite a man yet. I said that men sacrifice. You heard me mention Chief Willie Smoot. Clearly he has transitioned. But Chief Willie Smoot split verbs. Didn't get the best of edumacations. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Grandma had an edumacation. I am not talking about the Negroes that are present or our cousins with the degrees. I have a BA, an MAS, an MPA, getting ready to do a PhD, and I am the Director of Insignificance. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares if you got all these alphabets after your name? I'm the first black woman to do this, the first black man to do that, the first this, the first that. Who cares if you're the first if you're also going to be the last, Clarence Thomas? Yeah. 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 How do you get through a door and shut it so that my children can't get through? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How do you tell me what you've done for your children and you don't make it possible for me to do it for my children? Yes, Y'all tell me that you take care of your kids. You're supposed to take care of your kids. They're yours. But you get to heaven points when you help take care of other people's children. That's what Jesus did. It is important as men that we act like men, look like men, walk like men, talk like men. And sisters, don't take anything less than a man. Some of us running around here taking a piece of somebody else's man just to say, I got a man. He can't possibly be a man. Because a real black man knows that he can only handle one black woman at a time. Because that's a handful. Sacrifice, purpose-driven life. Chief Willie Smoot in, in 19... Are we okay? We okay on time. Che, 1995, February 21st, Lawrence Myers, a 16-year-old black male shot in the back of the head by a white cop in Pasadena, New Jersey, and they burned that city for three days. I received a phone call at 1 o'clock in the morning. They called my group, Black Cops Against Police Brutality, which I had founded in 1991. They said, Brother DeLacy, the kids are burning the town, and the family wants you to come here to try to bring peace to the community. I said, only if the parents ask, 
and any siblings in the family co-sign it. Because if they don't approve of me coming, I'm not coming. And folks say, well, why would you do Because I don't need the limelight. I don't know what I'm going to be asked to do. I'm not from Patterson. But I'm willing to come and lend whatever God will allow me to lend to the cause to help save a life. So I was loaned to the city of Patterson for six weeks. I worked 15 hour days. I walked the streets with the children. Let me say that again. I walked the streets with the children. I took off my bullet resistant vest. I took my gun off of me and I got down in the street with the children. How do we profess to, profess to believe in God and not willing to be tried by God? You're supposed to walk out there on faith. I think that's what I heard somebody tell Peter, step out of the boat. Yeah. Peter? Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I don't know if I can get out of the boat. I don't know if I can swim. You gotta have faith of a mustard seed. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. Y'all got me all fired up up in here. Chief Smoot let me come into the town. But he said, I'm worried about one of the cops shooting you in the back. So Smoot walked the beat with me. He was 65, 70 years old. He spent six weeks checking on me every day, even though I had a police officer as a backup because the cops vowed to kill me. Chief Smoot eventually had a heart attack and died out there. But the African tradition says when a person transitions, they never die if you continue to call their name. And so you heard me call his name. I continue to call the name. See, I'm here to tell you, and I stopped by to tell you, Camden, that flowers do bloom in Camden. I stopped by to tell you. I know it's hard. Camden looks like Newark. Just change the letters around. Whatever you want to do, they're the same animal. See, I lived in Newark when we were the number one crime city. I lived in Newark when I went to school and folks that didn't look like Newark told us that we weren't going to be anything. I lived in Newark and went to, kindergarten, went to kindergarten in Newark all the way through elementary school. I went to Catholic school for a minute and then got into arts high school. Self-taught artist. Wanted to draw, so I went to the library where the lies are buried and began to teach myself how to draw. Took the test, beat out 900 children, was one of 100 to go in, and an excellent artist by God's grace and mercy. Decided my next year I wanted to be a musician because they traveled and I didn't like drawing all the time. So I started teaching myself to play drums, to play kungas, and to read music. Took the test and got straight A's in music. Traveled all over the world. In the midst of people telling us that we were not going to be anything. That you don't speak well. I failed English and algebra freshman year. But got straight A's in Spanish. My mother said, you got to be crazy. Nobody in the family is Spanish. You fail in English and getting A's in Spanish. Something's wrong with you or you're wired wrong. <laughs> Mom smacked me around, beat me down. I went to college and my major was English. Because someone had poured into me and sown a seed and convinced me that even though you failed it, you can still turn it around because God allows you turns. Why don't we? And so I went on to get my degree. But that just wasn't enough. While on the police force, I began to see things that you see down here. Peace, peace officers not being peaceful. That was a nice way of saying it, Pastor. <laughs> peace officers not being peaceful. First black police officers in this country were seen in 1805 in Louisiana called the guard. Those black police officers could not arrest white people. In fact, they could not even walk around in uniforms with their guns around white folks. In fact, you only saw black police officers in 1805 when they were in parades and only in black parades and they could only arrest black people and watch free black people. Sounds a little bit like now. But that's our fault. It's our fault. Because, see, institutionalized racism requires institutionalized responses. Let me say that again. Institutionalized racism requires institutionalized responses. What we want to do is just be the first Negro to get through and say, well, I've made it. Who cares if you've made it if the rest of us don't? And so somebody wants to know, why is there this crab in the barrel mentality? Why do we pull each other down? We were bred that way. We were socialized that way. Let's be clear. Let me be clear for a minute. May I keep it real? There's no way in the world. You can come from beautiful black Africa, darker than a thousand beautiful midnights like my brother, come out light, bright, almost white like me, and there's somebody putting cream in the coffee and loving it, and I ain't talking about McDonald's. Act 
acting like we never had a science class. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, we made it. What, what's wrong with them? It's the parents' fault. It is. By a show of hands, some of us believe it takes an entire village to raise a child. Right? But what do you do when the village is on crack? What do you do when three of the village leaders have gone to jail for corruption? What do you do when the school system that's supposed to raise the village up has been taken over by the people that killed the other villages? What do you do when the police in the village don't look like the people in the village? And the people who look like the people in the village go for half the amount they got before they got there and act like they happy. It's some good old chicken. Boot licking, tap dancing, handkerchief head, knee bending. How I'm doing, son Negro? That is not success. I'm almost done. You're doing well. You're doing well this morning. Black manhood. We don't know how to teach it because we don't know how to define it. I gave you some pieces. Sacrifice. Leadership. Leading by example. Loving the child in spite of not loving the baby's mama. Oh, I can't be with you. I ain't taking care of the kid. Are you crazy? My father, who did not take care of me, my birth father, I met him at 14, and because I wouldn't change my name from DeLacy Dawood Davis to DeLacy Dawood Sobers, which is his namesake, and I was the last male child in his lineage, he refused to embrace me. He says, your family comes from all these great things, and until you go back to your, re your regular name, I will not acknowledge you. And I'd call him and I was hurting inside because something in me told me that my birth father wasn't my father. It was just a spirit. I could feel it. He was good to me. He never abused me. But he just wasn't my dad. God gives that to us as children. It's only when we become adults that we get crazy and our culture is molested and we play these games with ourselves and God. But the children are pure and innocent. Scripture is clear. It says, and a child shall lead them. Didn't say you with the college degree. Didn't say the people with the biggest church. Didn't say the pastor with the Rolex and the Jaguar. Hello, somebody. Hello. They told me church was wherever two or more were gathered. There too am I. So I'm trying to get it right. My father would not embrace me. And so I went looking for my sister who I knew existed. And I showed up at her house in Hackensack, New Jersey after finding my grandfather, who was a pastor, Theophilus Sobers, in White Plains, New York. It was like a movie. That was the first reality TV for me because they said, do we have any visitors here? And I was there with my friends and we stood up and they tell me I look just like the siblings in the family, but nobody knew who I was. And they said, well, what's your name? And I said, DeLacy Dawood Sobers, Pastor Sobers. And the church said, Whoo. Say that name again. The Lacey Dawood Sobers. Pastor Sobers. Uh, uh, I'll speak with you after, after church. I'll speak with you. I didn't want anything other than to find my family because my daughter had just been born. And I wanted her to know her family. And I'm glad we did because my sister, my birth sister, was hanging out in the same club that I was working at as a police officer during the time I was working it. And she was a cutie. I didn't know she was my sister. Can you imagine what could have happened? Mm. See, brothers, when you walk away from the family, because mm. you got a sickness and an illness, because your ego's been hurt, because she won't let you get away with playing games and talking about you out with your boys when you're lying and using your boy for cover. Mm. Yeah. The children suffer. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's when you walk away from your seed, yeah. men like me and the men in the congregation, we suffer. Because we got to take on your children. You spend 36 seconds making a baby and I got to spend 18 years raising it. What's wrong with you? You ain't no man. That's not how men behave in a civilized community. And the two or three sisters that snuck in, you're not a woman if you like them. Grandma said birds of a feather. And you judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. I know, I'm, I'm trying to get up off your toes. I'm almost out of here. Manhood, Piaget, let me go to Erickson. I, got some, I, I think I got learned people in the room. You don't have to admit, your cousins are learned. Let's go that route. 
But Piaget, the clinical psychologist, says that we develop and we learn in eight sequential stages. I'm going to make it plain, as Malcolm would say. I'm going to make it plain. And if you miss one of the eight sequential stages, you are forever deficient in your developmental stages. Now that's what Erickson says, and he was celebrated by the European. Well, Piaget comes along after Eric Erickson, and Piaget says it's not eight sequential stages, it's four stages that include the eight. And Piaget says that even if you learn something early in life and you forget later in life, you can learn it again. And we know that to be true because when people are in car accidents and they're paralyzed or they forget how to walk, talk, or speak, they're taught through therapy how to do it again. But these are still Europeans talking about how we develop. Why is it that we always go to the European for the development of the African? Part of it is because we suffer from xenophilia. What's that, right? That sounded deep, didn't it? <laughs> Xenophilia is the love of anything foreign. Mm. Just ask a few African people with a cu couple of degrees and three more dollars in their bank account than us. What are you? Uh, well, I'm part Cherokee. Um, I'm a little Irish, and I got a little mud in me, too. <laughs> Why don't you want to be all black? Mm. Why don't you want to be African? Mm. I didn't say you had to go back to Africa. But why deny who you are? Because when you deny who you are, you get who you become. And everybody knows who you are but us. Happy, clapping, boot licking, tap dancing, handkerchief head, knee bending, how I'm doing son Negro. Just hopping around, scratching, don't even itch. Just, just looking happy. Go ahead. Raining outside. Storm Sandy. How you going? I'm just blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed all over. I, I feel it all over me. You lying. Even Jesus had some hard time. The disciples had some hard time. Even Jesus fought some time. The baddest revolutionary I know is Jesus Christ. And we come here meek and mild and just hold on. I don't want to get in no trouble. Just want to keep my little job. And I don't know. I see that over there going on. They ain't going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. I wonder why the children hate us. They're looking for men. They're looking for men. And now it's gotten so bad that the men looking for men. He, he want what you looking for. What the heck? <laughs> Boy, I'm looking for a man too. Hey, We can't be that scarce. One of the solutions is when we leave here today, now I understand before you came, you may not have known, and in fact, you may not invite me back, but you'll know I was here. But the first thing I want you to do is know what a man looks like, talks like, acts like, and walks like. He speaks truth to power. God is first and foremost the beginning and the end in his or her life. You can see God all over him. I don't care what he wants to call it. You see God in him. Yes. Yes. You see humility in him. Yes. You will know he, he's a man by the way he talks to the children. Yes. The way the children gather around him. Yes. And the choice of words that he uses with the children. Yes. Fix it. Fix it. Check. 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 Now I know some of you got to go home now and change your vocal cords. <laughs> got to turn it down a couple of notches. Brother told me one time, Brother Felicia, every now and then you got to smack your woman. Every now and then. I said, well, you wouldn't smack my woman but once. It ain't going to be now and then. Because the woman I know, my, my grandmama would get you with this hand, okay? My mama would jump you. I mean, we just, I come from strong black women. My mother told me, if you ever hit a woman, if I hear that you hit her, we're going to beat you down when we catch you. That was my mama talking about some other woman. It just wasn't tolerated. Naeem Akbar says that we develop in three stages, maleness, boyhood, and manhood. Maleness is the state of being born with the male organ. That's the give it to me stage. Now, I'm not talking about anybody here, but that's when you want food right away, your biological needs met right away. You want everything right now. Sound like this generation, doesn't it? The maleness stage. But we're supposed to transform from maleness to boyhood. And boyhood is a development of discipline. Initially, it comes from the outside, which is why the men in the village are important. Because the men are supposed to say, young man, that's not acceptable. 
And I'm not talking about running up to the guy and blaming him for having his pants down. Maybe his pants are down because he doesn't have any more. I doubt it. Because we saw nasty Rick Ross yesterday with his pants down and a belt on and he's all over the place. And the sad part is, we see him with their pants down and they got fruit of the loom underwear on. And, and some of the problem is the sisters, because you know that you saw those fruit of the looms the other day. And you could tell because the grape has jumped off, the orange is holding his nose, and the apple is starting to look like a pear. In the boyhood stage, there's this slick discipline. If I do this, I can get that. But when you transform to manhood, what transforms a boy to a man is knowledge. Knowledge of self, knowledge of God, knowledge of his culture, knowledge of his tradition, knowledge of his people, knowledge of his woman, knowledge of the first Mother, which is Mother Africa, Lucy. Yeah. Everybody knows that. Now, it's important who we are. I'm, I'm wrapping up. Some solutions. We must be instruments of guidance, brothers. When you're working with a sister's child, you're not working on her. Let me say that again. Brother said yesterday in the forum, he said, what happens when the boundaries get crossed? I said, well, they're going to get crossed because, you know, none of us is perfect and some of us just nasty. I don't know another word to describe it. Just nasty. <laughs> Chat, how many of us got some cousins that we know they just nasty? They, they, they don't, you don't even want to own your cousins now. The brother's got their hands down. I've seen them acting crazy from 8 to 88. Now, I don't make me call you out. We got to check that behavior. Yeah. Because young brothers are watching us. Yes. See, I wondered why the old guys sat around on the corner, around the garbage can, why they sat at Dunkin' Donuts talking and met every week. Mm. But now I've become the old guy. Mm. And while I'm a young 51, I'm the old guy compared to 12, 13, 14. That's right. That's right. That's and so now when we sit and talk, we're having a different kind of conversation. We were talking about scripture and books this morning in the, in, in the pastor's office. Mm. But see, when you're young and simple and silly, you're talking about taking a girl out to McDonald's, buying her a Happy Meal and a toy, and trying to figure out how to play with her all night. Those are silly games that boys play. Yeah. That yeah. can't be the game that men play. Yeah. Check. Yeah. Almost done. Solution. Brothers, sisters, mothers, give these young brothers early work responsibility. Yes. 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 And a leadership model says that what you reward is what will get done. So I go into schools, I'm, I know I'll give you all my title, school principal, five years. Again, I learned they didn't know how to run a school. They asked me to run a school. I turned the job down two times. Third time, they said, you're going to come run the school. We didn't fire two principals. I said, I never ran a school. They said, well, we think you can do it. So I went, ran a school five years by God's grace. They asked me, how do you learn? I said, I don't know. I can only give God the credit. It ain't me. They tell me if you don't get tested, you don't have a testimony. So that's my story. And what happens is that we don't give them work early. We reward them. Kid failing everything in school got the best sneakers on. Done up. Failed everything in school. You run around talking about, hey, don't he look cute? Ain't he? That's my little man. He's not a man. He's a mouse. I want to be real clear about this. Languaging is important. You call boy children men. And they grow up believing in a man of the house. And when they step to you at about 13 or 14, you wonder why he slapped the taste out of your mouth. Because you started grooming them at three, four, and five to be the man of the house. And you kept saying because you were feeling sick because you picked a mouse to lay down with. And now because you got mouse lings. <laughs> that sounded like a word. Mouse lings, right? <laughs> That's little meese, right? <laughs> You know, my mother would make up words. My mother, may God bless her. I, mom said, what's the past tense of squeeze? She said, squoze. I said, Ma, that's not a word. I said, that's not a word, Ma. But now I understand. I'm talking about mouthlings. But what's happened is that you programmed him to believe that he's a man. And then what you've done, and this is a whole other workshop, and God willing, we'll be able to come back and do this again. But the workshop is about pimps, prostitutes, mothers, and sons. What do they have in common? Well, you go out and work and make the money. Mm. 
He goes to school and fails. You come home and give him your money by buying him clothes, sneakers, gym suits, letting them go out, party, cell phone, beeper, food, friends, party, club, and a car, and he ain't done nothing for it other than tell you go get it. Sound like a pimp to me. It don't matter that he's seven. So they're pimping you. And I'm sorry to have to bring the news that you've been pimped. Yeah. Punk, hoodwink, and bamboozle. Yeah. Yeah. Not once, but twice. Yeah. Cause not only is he doing it to you, but daddy did it and left you. Yeah. And you're mad with men. Yeah. You know you're mad with men, which is why you act like that. Yeah. Yeah. Good God. Wow. Wow. And so as I encourage brothers to go back to where their children are, yeah. to build a relationship, yeah. you got to be receptive to him coming back and forgiving the hurt that he's caused. Yeah. So let me say to the sisters, because my daughters have had this experience. I apologize to you for the men who raped you. Yeah. The fathers who touched you inappropriately. Yeah. The brothers that played games with you. Wow. The men that you thought loved you went down the aisle and said they do and they don't. And did it with her, him, and Shim. Yeah. Not only was he on the down low, he's down low and low down. I apologize. Yes. I apologize for the check that they said was in the mail and it never arrived. Yeah. I apologize that you had to make something out of nothing. Yeah. I apologize that you had to be the bridge over troubled water. Yes. I apologize yes. for the man not being a man but acting like a mouse. Yes. I apologize, sisters. Yes. But then you got to forgive yourself for however it happened. And once you forgive yourself and ask God to help you find his perfect peace, then you can move forward, not looking for love in all the wrong places, in the club, in the bar, out there being cute and sashaying. As grandma used to say, um, zag nutting. You know, you, could, you know who they are. Just always in somebody's face and it ain't your body's face. It's okay to forgive yourself. Yes, Lord. It's okay. Because yes. our children are in pain. Yes. And our children are in crisis. Yes. And our men don't know how to be men. And even the men who realize they've made a mistake and want to come back and get it right, you're so angry with men that you won't even give them that chance. I'm going to tell a simple story and I'm going to get out of here. See, my daughter's mother and I split when she was 14. My daughter's now 21. She graduated last month from New England Conservatory of Music in Boston with a 3.8 grade point average, academic honors, and a $40,000 scholarship from the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. But we programmed her for success. And when her mother left at 14, and I'll just say that it just wasn't a good split, she left and someone else wooed her. And she thought the grass was greener on the other side. It was greener, but it was artificial turf, and that doesn't grow. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Brothers, you got to know your worth. Now, I will say admittedly, I cried for three years. And even though she left me, I begged her to come back every day for three years. I wanted to die every day the first year. I just thought that I might live through the attempted suicide and didn't want to live mangled. And I'm sharing with you, brothers, because we don't often talk about crying. They talk about men crying in the dark. No, I cry in the daylight. Mm. And I cried chasing after a woman that didn't want me any longer. And I respect that. But what I celebrate on my Facebook page and what I tell her all the time, you have been an excellent mother. And in spite of the differences that we had, we didn't have to go to court for child support. We split everything down the middle. When I got laid off, you picked up a little slack for me. When you were short, I picked up slack for you. And it was never a conversation around whether or not you're going to do this for me in exchange for the money. We understood that we both laid down 36 seconds to make that beautiful baby that sings opera. It was both of our responsibilities. And so I say to you, brothers, these are our sisters. You're supposed to cover them down. We're supposed to protect them. This is not by accident. I love what I've seen here. I've seen the duality of the African male and female energy all over this church. We have, I've seen a brother lead and I've seen a sister leading. Where have I seen an older brother? I've seen a younger brother. 
Brother, we got to lead by example. Some of us got to know that there's some changes we got to make when we leave here today. Some changes. If there's a baby you haven't touched, go back and kiss your baby. If you don't have the child support, be honest. I don't have the money, but I still want to have the relationship. Because, see, the child really doesn't care about the money. The child cares about the man. I don't care if you're a domestic violence dad, if you're a mad dad, if you're a dope fiend dad, if you're an HIV dad. Your baby loves you, dad. And I'm here to tell you that you need to get with other men who can help you feel better so you're not running through other women because you feel so bad about who you really are. So that you need a broke down sister to help you feel better about your brokenness. See, God allows U-turns, and we know that. And so I'm simply saying to this congregation, you have been excellent. You are doing the work. You are doing God's work. Brothers, I'm telling you today, you can choose education. You can go into the schools. You can volunteer. You can mentor. You can show up more at church. You can take a role here in the church. You can help the sisters forward. You can go to someone's house. You can deal with the shutting. You can mentor the children. You can do a study group. You can do a mentoring group. You can do a Boy Scout troop. You can walk the street. You can create a safety corridor so the children don't get jumped in certain neighborhoods. You can go 20 deep from the church and just go spread God's word in the project across the street, down the street, up the street, around the street, behind the street. Bring them to your street in my street your hood i'm saying to you god is still alive god is still sitting high and seeing low he knows the work that you're doing he knows the work that your pastor's doing god bless you men stand up act like men look like men talk like men and walk like men god bless you and thank you very much brothers and sisters The gospel has been preached today. I said the gospel has been preached today. Can I say it one more time? The gospel has been preached today. As, if I can, I, I, I want just the men today, the men, the fine men, men, women. We, this kind of unofficial men's day this morning. As the men are coming, as they walk down the aisle, some man, some woman, some boy, some girl is here. And we at Canaan Avenue is going to make up our mind. We're going to do the right thing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I say that one more time? Yes, sir. Yeah. Deacon Beckley, I want you, if you will, you pray for us. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, just now. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. He will save you. He will save you. He will save. What a man come on the altar. We just come up. Come on. Come on. Come up. Just now, he will save you. It says, only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust. Only trust. Only trust him and just now only trust only trust Please bow your hands as Deacon Beckley takes us to the throne of grace. Dear Father, we come today, Lord, just asking you to intercede on our behalf. We have men who have come to the altar today, Lord, to really hear from you and to get your guidance, Lord. I ask that you touch each and every one of them, Lord. We come wounded. We come hurt. We come molested. We come unloved. Show us the way, Lord. For those of us who are fathers, Lord, 
show us how to go back and reclaim the sons and the daughters that we have forsaken, Lord. Show us how to say I love you to each other, to our children, to our spouses, to our girlfriends, and say it in a way that they understand and know that we truly, truly, truly mean it. That we are asking for nothing in return just to let them know how we feel about them. That we love them, that we care for them. Lord, change our minds, renew our minds, transform us so that we can be the men that you wanted us to be. Lord, we are the way we are because of things that have happened in our past. But we have to let those things go, Lord. We have to begin to understand your word and to move forward. Again, touch us, Lord. Show us the way. Give us your grace and mercy so that we can be the men that you wanted us to be, regardless of what has happened to us in the past. Forgive those. Allow us to forgive those who have caused us harm so that, again, we can move on and not pass it on to others, Lord. Just touch us. Continue to love us. Continue to hold us. And, Lord, teach us how to ask for help. Take away that pride that we have. Allow us to cry. Allow us to show emotion. Allow us to just hug each other and care for each other. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, brothers, it's all right to hug.